thank you very much for giving up your lunch hour um, to come along to the talk. Um, my chosen topic uh, incorporates a personal interest in Roman architecture and love of Rome, but also um, the aim of the talk is to get you at the end as an audience to try and apply the lessons we're going to look at in Roman history to a modern cityscape. Um, I've chosen London because that's the, the most local one, but um, you can apply this to most cities and throughout most periods of time when we look at the principles of what buildings tell us about people who build them and why people build buildings. Um, the sort of view that I'm taking is looking through the city of Rome and especially how emperors shape and build upon their predecessors' patterns in Rome. Um, we're also going to be looking at these buildings in an original context rather than as we might see them as tourist attractions, but um, not as tourist attractions, but as in the context they originally built, what were they built for, who built them, why they built them. And then once we've looked at our three main arguments, we're going to apply them to uh, modern day. So um, on to my first argument, that all buildings, and this is whether they're ancient, whether they're modern, are built to demonstrate that builder's power and status. You don't get a cityscape like ancient Rome, like modern London, like Paris, without people wanting to demonstrate and exert their power and status over a populace. Buildings in many ways are built not just for functional reasons, whether they're a theatre or whether they're a coliseum, everyone knows what that was for, but they're actually also built as a demonstration of, of power and status and to exert that power and status upon a populace. Now, if we think about the basic rudiments of building in a space, this is the site of the, the city of Rome, sort of circa about 3 AD, um, just like in the modern day, land is expensive. So you can't build here unless you are very rich. Labour is expensive. To get the materials and to get the people to build these absolutely vast monuments, you need to have a certain amount of power, status and money and everything that goes with that. The other thing that comes into this is that not everyone can build. If you were just Joe Bloggs on the street, you cannot hope to build anything in the context of the city of Rome. Far, far, far fewer opportunities for building were available than they are, say, today for a, a personal philanthropist who just happens to have lots of money and wants to build something. That's because emperors actually monopolised building. They monopolised it by saying only emperors are allowed to build in the city of Rome. So from about the 1st century AD, all of these buildings that you know, like this is the Circus Maximus and the Colosseum, they're built by emperors, and emperors exclusively. Now the emperors didn't just do this for some kind of power trip, they did it deliberately to exclude anyone else competing in the arena of building. And that's really very, very important when we see about how they are using buildings to control their personal image, to control their populace, to control what people are thinking about them and the empire. So um, when we start to see buildings not as just bits of marble or bits of ruins, and we actually see them as political tools, um, they become interesting. OK, on to our first type of monumental building. Um, this is a typical monumental type. It's what we call a triumphal arch. There are several in London. You might have been to Marble Arch. There's the arch very similar to this, built obviously much later, but on a similar style. Um, you might have also been to Paris, linked to the Arc de Triomphe. Okay, so it's a very, very recognisable type, copied the world over, centuries over. What it was actually built for originally is uh, part of the purpose of, of the way it works. Is If you imagine standing here, you're standing on what we call the Via Sacra, the sacred way, and you're looking down into the Roman Forum, and this was the route of the triumphal procession. And what a triumph was, was if you were a, a great Roman general and you defeated the barbarian hordes of, insert European country here, you would be voted and awarded a triumph. And at this triumph, you were allowed to ride in a chariot through Rome. This is very rare, because contrary to our expectations, Romans don't drive around chariots in Rome. It's pedestrianised, you're not allowed to be in a chariot. So it's a big thing, you're in your chariot, 
your uh, face is painted with cinnabar, so you're bright red, you're in a purple cloak, you have someone standing behind you dressed as the goddess Victory, saying, remember thou art not a god, and behind you march your victorious army, and your victorious army not only lead barbarians who you've conquered to be slaughtered into the forum, but they even did things like uproot <coughs> trees from provinces they conquered, lead wild animals in procession, as well as things more noticeably showy, like statues and, and general you know, objects of booty, gold. And so it was a, it was a real um, demonstration of domination. But that was just a day. So how, if you are a triumphator, how is anyone going to remember that down the successive ages? You don't just want people to remember your triumph because you had a great party and you might have slaughtered 10,000 more barbarians than your predecessor. You need something solid and literally concrete that is going to be there forever to commemorate that triumph. And this becomes monopolised by emperors. This is actually the Arch of Titus. Um, Titus didn't have a very long reign because his, his life was cut pretty short, um, but he conquered the province of Judea, so like modern-day Israel and Palestine. Um, the symbols of victory are really important. This is the, uh, like a, um, a zooming in on the, the top of the barrel arch. Um, Romans weren't scared of symbolising victory in very, very explicit terms, and this is something we're going to see recurring in our view of monuments. Um, these are winged victories, and I don't know if you can see here, but what they're actually carrying are Roman standards. This sort of like mini dress here is the top of a Roman standard, and what these winged victories stand on are globes. And the message we're supposed to take from this sort of visual vocabulary is not just dominion of Judea, this is world dominion. And it's also world dominion that's been sanctified by the goddesses' victory themselves. Okay, so that the gods of victory, like victories. Um, here is a keystone on which stands, you can't see it's been eroded, the goddess Roma. So Roma in a personified form stands in the middle of the arch and the victories come either side of it. A, a very explicit image of dominion that all centres upon Rome. Um, another way of advertising, if you like, that this is your arch, is inscription. And this is something quite interesting when you apply it to even a school like Hopethorpe. Um, modern buildings that are put up now will all have a dedicatory inscription saying it was built by this person, on this date, opened maybe by a minor royal at some point. And this will be advertising why the building's there and the sort of um, the commemorative aspect of that building. So Roman arches always have an inscription. Um, this one is particularly interesting because it's actually dedicated to Titus by the Sonatus Populusque Romanus, which my class of set know is the PQR. SPQR, Senate and People of Rome. Um, and the Senate and People of Rome dedicated this arch to Titus. Now, as a historian, you've got to sort of pinch yourself and think, okay, the Senate and people of Rome have dedicated this arch to Titus, but the whole message on this arch is of Titus's victory. It is a victory for the people of Rome, but if we just look at the internal sculptures, if you remember the, the picture of the barrel arch? If we went through the arch here, on either side are these panel reliefs. So you walk through the arch and you see these reliefs. This is a message of not just the Senate and people's Rome of people of Rome's victory, but of Titus's victory in particular. And this is really interesting as a Roman historian because we see objects being carried in procession, which are particular to the province of Judea. This is the massive menorah which was taken from the temple at Jerusalem, which had been sacked by Titus. These placards would have all been painted, in fact the whole frieze would have been painted, but on those placards are the names of individual places that Titus's army had conquered. Um, what is really lovely about this is that it's completely mimetic. Mimetic means it's, it's miming literally what happened. So if we imagine the actual event when Titus's arch was opened, Titus had his triumph, they would have gone through that arch, and what are the panels depicting? The panels are depicting them going through the arch which is really interesting. 
Um, and we've got lots of other things too here. Um, we've got the shorebread table. We have here these, these chaps blowing these huge trumpets. We get a sense of like the, the sound of the triumph, the, the noise, the, the frenetic activity, all is brought over by the, the sculpture in the middle of the arch. On the other side, we have a picture of Titus himself. His face has been knocked out a bit. Um, and this is his quadriga, his four-horse chariot. And behind him, as I said before, is this winged victory, whispering in his ear, remember thou are not a god. Um, so those two panels show you very, very closely that this is like an advertisement. It's like a billboard. That's the sort of catchphrase that a lot of Roman architectural historians use. It's like a billboard advertising. Titus as A, a great general, and B, showing his incredible um, ability to bring goods into Rome. Romans were insatiable collectors of things. And to add to this, we know that these objects were then housed in a temple that was like a museum where normal Romans wanted to go and see, or I want to go and see the menorah that's been captured from the temple at Jerusalem, or I want to go and um, uh, uh, look at how much gold Titus has brought back. It's a great advertisement for him and his dynasty and his reign. And we've got to think as ancients rather than as moderns about this because this is not an age where you have the internet. It's not an age where you can flick on the television and see what's happening. The Romans had no conception of the exoticness of somewhere like Judea. You know, that it was like saying the moon to a five-year-old child. <laughs> so they wanted to go and see these things. But they can't turn on a television, they can't pick up a newspaper. So it needs to be in Rome and it needs to be visual and it needs to be in some way permanent. So that's how we get triumphal arches. Uh, this next slide is, it's not good enough if you can't get to Rome really, is it? Because the arch is in Rome and that's a bit of a problem. And we know that if you're a Roman, you're not just in Rome. You can be as far flung as Hadrian's Wall, to Persia, to Bactria, to Spain, right? So far north, south, east, west. You can be all, in all of these places and be a Roman. So how do you access this imperial advertisement? Well, the emperors had thought of this one and they thought, aha, I will get myself an arch and I will put it on coins. And these coins will go all around the emperor as a way of diffusing this imperial image of buildings. Buildings express, as the argument said, at the beginning of the speech, power and status, but you've got to be able to access that power and status to feel the force. So coinage is an amazing way of looking at buildings. Another thing is a Roman historian where we get very excited about coins and everyone thinks you're a little bit mad, is that coins are also a great way of seeing the monuments we don't have. Monuments that haven't survived in the visual record in Rome are often, you can find out what they looked out at look look like if you can find a coin with them minted on, which is um, an exciting bit of the record. Okay, on to the next. Um, my second argument here, which is both ancient and modern, is that all builders engage in competition. It's not good enough just to build a victory monument. You need to build a victory monument that is better than your predecessor and better than your predecessor's predecessor. Um, this idea of building a column, you might recognise it's Traven's column, like we you know Nelson's column, like we you know a column in Place Vendôme. Columns, big cities generally have tall buildings like columns. The idea of building a column actually comes from the east. It comes from uh, eastern potentates during the time of Alexander the Great, start building big columns. And the original reason for this was if you can build a monument that is big enough, you can put yourself on it, and you can put yourself on it going up. Why would you want that? What's the idea of putting yourself on a pedestal, literally, very big one, pointing up? What's up there? Heaven. So you're saying, look, I'm ascending towards heaven. I am practically a god. So um, you will not be surprised to know that Trajan's column is thought to be his funeral monument, and that he was actually buried here, and the massive statue, that's not Trajan at the minute, it's a, it's a pope, but um, if, you, if you imagine a massive and huge statue of Trajan on it, we're actually supposed to feel, when we look at Trajan's column, this is the emperor's ascendancy into heaven. Now, um, the actual 
column here, um, if you imagine someone standing, uh, I would sort of come up to maybe about here, this is ground level, it's over um, 100 Roman feet tall, it is made of barrel drums of travertine marble, which have a frieze that run around it like a helix. And uh, what this frieze depicts is Trojan, Trajan's victory over the Dacians, which is modern day Romania. Um, how it works, oh, sorry, how it works is that it goes around like a ticker tape in a helixical frieze. And it starts from the very start of the war. And, and Trajan, in order to advertise his war, wrote commentarii, diaries about. Uh, when we got to Dacia, we set up camp, we forged the river, and we get like a day-by-day -day account of how he then went on to conquer Dacia and bring back a vast wealth to Rome. And his commentarii form the basis of the story of the frieze. So the frieze is really interesting, especially if you're a military historian, because we see all of the, the bits and bobs that happened before Rome, uh, the war. Here we have um, Trajan as emperor, and he is performing a sacrifice. Here are the unfortunate sacrificial victims, the uh, typical ram and bull and pig uh, combination. And we have uh, here the blowing of trumpets to commemorate the sacrifice. So um, all of the various stages of warfare, going from sacrifice to the business of war itself, are told in this amazing story that goes through the arch. So everything from military administ administration to the emperor himself. Trajan appears ten times in different guises in the arch. When I say different guises, it's the emperor doing different things. We have the emperor as a great and holy man sacrificing. We have the emperor as orator here. He's standing on his plinth, and this is what we call an ad locutio scene. He's addressing the troops, so it's him giving a stirring speech. And then later on, we get the emperor being presented with the grisly heads of the barbarians that have been sacked from their city and then decapitated. So the emperor um, here, you might see even sort of a, a, a steely look of um, reserve as he's presented with these heads, like the bloody business of war. Um, the whole monument is geared up towards military triumph, just like the arch was, but goes into a huge amount of detail. That sort of formation of a column gives us the ability to to read the emperor in 10 different guises, rather than just one. Okay, now, if that wasn't enough, if we were in Rome right now, if we walked about four minutes down the road, we'd find another column just like that, but this one is Marcus Aurelius. And this is our argument about competition. You can't just build a great monument, it has to be bigger and better than your predecessors. Marcus Aurelius came after Trajan, he had a great victory over a Danubian tribe, a tribe like on the other side of the Danube in Germany. And he decided to commemorate his victory again with a column. Except this time it was going to be about four feet bigger than Trajan's column. Very important four feet to Marcus Aurelius. Um, the actual base of this column is underneath this palazzo here. Um, it, 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 so it looks smaller, but it's not, because most of it's underneath. Um, now, the sculpture on this column is a little bit different and very interesting. It's in deeper relief. What that means is the, um, the figures literally stick out more. They're more 3D. <coughs> and Marcus Aurelius obviously thought, love Trajan's column, very nice, but a uh, bit boring. Don't want all of that administration bit, the sacrificing bit. Let's just have war. So the whole freeze is one battle after another battle after another battle and they're all really violent and really gory and also really emotional. If you look at this here, this is the actual, rather than having the decapitated heads sort of lifted up to the emperor, this is the act of decapitation going on in front of the emperor by many, many, many different barbarians, all of whom have their hands bound behind their back and whose faces are given such emotional power. You see this sort of grief and terror and angst in their faces as they're being decapitated. Um, Marcus Aurelius says what one-upmanship here is to go bloodier, to go gorier, to go more, more emotional and in deeper relief. Um, that shows you there, but this is one of several scenes where we see the act of um, a barbarian being cut down.
town murdered in the most um, graphic sense. Um, to put this in a modern context, we've gone to war this, sort of this morning-ish, I suppose, about 12 o'clock last night. Um, if, hopefully, this war is resolved and victory goes to the hands of the Allies, I don't think you could imagine a similar monument being made today showing the slaughter of IS troops on the ground in a very, very visual public sphere. That kind of visual vocabulary of conquest is alien to us, but curiously is not so alien to IS who will put images of decapitation on their website. It's just a, 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 you might look at this and think, well, that's weird. You know, the Romans, wow. But in actual fact, um, the publication of um, images as violent as this do happen today, but just in a different sphere. Okay, my last argument is going to be that the lives of ancient Romans and our lives in the modern world are controlled by those who construct buildings in their own city. You all recognise this, I hope. It's the Colosseum, uh, the Flavian Amphitheatre, um, the, the arena of death, as some like, like to call it. It is the, uh, the place where gladiatorial fights happened in Rome, and it was built by the Emperor Vespasian, the father of Titus. And this building is very interesting, but maybe not for the reasons you think it is. We all like it because of the film Gladiator, or we like learning about gladiators, etc. But the actual story of it, why it was built, is really interesting. Um, this is the Flavian Amphitheatre here. This is the Roman Forum, and this is the Capitoline Hill. So our arch, which we started off, is just here. And the Colosseum stands at the entrance to the Roman Forum along the Via Sacra. Now, what that originally was, was a boating lake. And it was part of Nero's private pleasure palace, the Domus Aurea, the Golden House. And all of this area here, so right in the middle of the most sacred heart of Rome, was taken over by Nero's golden house. And as we all know, Nero, mad as a sack of cats, burns Rome, etc. if that's the route you would like to go down. Um, he took over this area, made an incredible palace, built a boating lake for him to go and have lovely parties on, and eventually is deposed for various different reasons, and is succeeded by Vespasian, the new emperor. So Vespasian wants to erase that public relations image and bring a new one in. And so he does this by draining the lake, and you can see here that it's actually in a depression of hills. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's, a, it's, a it's a nice site for a lake, but he drains it and builds the Colosseum. And it's a public message. It's saying that Nero was all about himself, all about his own personal enjoyment and pleasure, and I'm going to be an emperor for the people who builds the Colosseum. It can hold, you know, uh, hold up to about 80,000 Romans at one time. It's accessible to all different spheres of society, um, which is illustrated by this. So everyone from the senators to the equestrian middle classes, intermediary categories, uh, which would have been uh, foreigners, I suppose, and women and ple plebs right at the, the top. So a whole section of society. And the point about this is that the emperor has control over it. He is the person who gives the shows. He is the benefactor of the shows. He decides what image the shows take, uh, who the gladiators fight, how many gladiators he decides to fund. And he can also use this as a, um, a tool of largesse in order to give things away. And the phrase Roman historians use is panes and kekenses, bread and circuses. So games, entertain the Romans, give them their dole, which is their, their bread ration. And it shows the emperor in the centre, literally in the centre of the Colosseum, being able to control his populace through, the, through this building. Um, one of the reasons why the Romans loved this so much, and one of the reasons why they flocked to the Colosseum, is how exotic it was. As we said before, the conquest of the Roman Empire had sort of exceeded everybody's expectations in terms of the variety of tribes they conquered. Everything from you know, the snivelling Bretunculi up in, in northern England and their mud hearts to the really exotic tribes of North Africa. Um, and the Romans all wanted to see a bit of this. 
So the, the Colosseum was a theatre of the exotic. That's why we have all of the wild animals and the gladiators dressed up in funny costumes. Um, okay, my last point of contact with this really is how different is a modern cityscape in those three aspects we've talk, talked about? That buildings demonstrate power and status. Well, I don't think anyone could disagree with the fact the only, now not people, but organisations who can build anything in such a cityscape have both power, financially and politically, um, and status. Um, this is not an arena where the normal person can build, neither was ancient Rome. Um, these buildings carry a message of, of power and status by the expense lavished upon their building, by um, uh, those people who, who uh, use them, um, how expensive they are to access. If you need to rent any office space there, you're talking at a huge premium. So everything about this is about elitism, expense, and power. Um, the next argument which we came across was uh, looking at the idea of competition. And this again comes out very much not just in London, but on a global sphere. It's all about who can build the biggest building. Uh, since the Gherkins' arrival a few years ago, this, this area of the City of London is a constant building site for co companies to build ever bigger, ever more elaborate, ever more experimental buildings. One looks like a typewriter, one looks like a cheese grater. You know, they're, they're all given nicknames, but this is to uh, make light of the fact that they're all in competition with each other because they all want to look shinier and newer and more expensive and more snazzy than the next. You don't build a building not to compete in this arena, it's an arena of competition. And the final point was it's built to control. Now, I think this is very much you feel when you live in a city, that you have a relationship with the buildings that you walk past every day. And if you think about who are financing these buildings, they're not just thinking about them as office spaces for people to work. They're thinking about them as for places to go and meet. Otherwise, why would you put bars on top of these great office blocks and buildings? Because they want them to be a place where people go um, almost as tourist monuments. You know, when you can actually go to the Oxo Tower and go there as a tourist. You can go for a trip up the Shard. You can go for a trip up the Gherkin. They're not just office blocks. They are political statements, they are financial statements, they are there to control the populace of London. Um, and so, hopefully, through those three guises, we can see that even though ancient Rome uh, is a long time ago in terms of its conception, there are 2,000 years spanning the building of the Arch of Titus and the Gherkin, in actual fact, the three main contributing factors to why they are there and what they do um, are pretty similar. Do you have any questions? Hello? I have a question. Um, in your opinion, which, which modern building best sort of reflects that, that concept of power and prestige that was, that was used when the ancient building was growing? I, I think all of them. I mean, in terms of, in terms of shape, the shape doesn't really matter. Um, because they are, they're all reaching up for um, innovation as part of competition. So uh, they're, not, they're not building you know, Trajan's column star monuments anymore. They're not building victory arches. They're building different shapes. But the fact they're building different shapes is because they want to compete in a different arena. So um, in terms of visuals, even though they may look very different from the classical and they're deliberately moving away from the class of all types of monumental arch or column or whatever it might be because they don't want to look old-fashioned, they want to look new. But the actual essence behind that is just what a Roman emperor would do because he does not want his monument to look like, just like someone else's. It has to be new. And through its innovation comes competition and where you can prove that you are bigger and better than the next person. Um, but this is interesting in terms that it doesn't confine itself to London because London is in competition with New York and New York's in competition with you know Dubai and Dubai's in competition with Hong Kong and everyone's trying to build the biggest building. And 
Um, and it's interesting. And I wondered if you, when you go to a city, do you feel like the buildings are there for you, enjoy, to, for you to enjoy, or do you feel like sometimes the buildings are there to control you? There's a mutual relationship between the building you're in. Like, the building we're, we're in now is very pleasant to be in because you can see out from both sides. So you don't feel like you're trapped. Now, part of the sort of theories of architecture that go behind some of these buildings is that they have the same, this idea of transparency, that you can see into them and you can see out of them and you feel like you're not being penned in by the building, but the building is allowing you to sort of emanate around it. Um, but it, buildings do try and, and channel people and funnel people in certain ways. Um, if you think about the difference between the older part of school and this part of school, the older part of school is obviously far more classical in terms of the visual symbols it uses, the columns, the, the pediments, the stuccoed room, and all of that's hugely Roman. Um, but it's there for a purpose. It's there to make you think of the grandeur of Rome. We're supposed to be inspired when we walk into the main, in, into the main school. And we're supposed to think about you know, the, the, the great deeds of the Romans or the, the, the nobility of you know, the Roman spirit and the Roman achievement in a kind of second-hand <laughs> renaissance channeled way. Yeah. Do you think that because the Romans depicted the, the, the gore of their victories in the same way that we have become accustomed to IS doing the same thing now, that the Romans were a successful terrorist organization? That's a really good question. Because the, the kind of atrocities that they were inured to, I mean, they're, they're very entertainment. You might play, I don't know what's it called, Call of Duty or something, when you go and you like shoot people up and decapitate them. And, and, that, and that's, that's recreation. Romans' recreation is to go and see people actually murdered in front of their own eyes. And, and the actual act of conquest is bloody, and the Romans enjoyed that. And part of the thing of the Colosseum is that you couldn't get to go, you, it's not like they were going to sell tickets for the day, you know, the, Trajan's victory over Dacia, like, roll up, come to Dacia, see us go and murder some barbarians. But what they could do is bring that kind of slaughter into a central arena in Rome and reenact the very business of battle, and they enjoyed violence. And this is a really, really distasteful thing to us, because you know, as a Roman historian, if you enjoy Roman literature, if you enjoy Roman culture, you tend to focus on you know, the sublime beauties of the Aeneid, or, or their intensely interesting philosophy. But the distasteful thing is, is that in order to have, have ro risen a civilization, grown a civilization, to have rose to such heights, that they've committed what we would consider human atrocities on a absolutely colossal scale. But what a Roman would argue would be something actually coming straight from the Iliad, that their job as a Roman, their mission statement, was to spare the conquered and war down the proud. That's the phrase that comes from Virgil's Aeneid. And what it meant is that if you, if, a, if the Roman troops turned up at your door and you realised you're beaten from the start and you say, no thanks, that's okay, you can rule, I'll just tow the line, then you're fine. And that's why they assimilated. So many people actually wanted to be Roman and they offered this, this talisman of having Roman citizenship and Roman protection. But if you rebelled, if you said no, if you were you know, the proud uh, in Virgil's speech, you would be wore down and they would have, give you no quarter. So that's a very good question. But it, there remains the essential fact that to us, the Romans' um, desensitization to violence is brutal and inhuman. It's a really good question, because obviously the modern buildings we're looking at now, most of them are constructed of glass, but in actual fact, if they were constructed of marble, they'd be a lot more expensive. So um, whether you're trying to sort of uh, stress your wealth or stress uh, diversity, I think because of the diversity of forms, they've chosen, chosen to make things from glass, and because of a modern-day concept of beauty tends to be quite minimalist, doesn't it? 
where we want clean lines and everything to be very, very transparent. But it doesn't mean to say that in, in your lifetime, when you, you are your parents' age, this visual repertoire might have been put in the bin. And we could be see buildings made of, I don't know, jelly baby or something. We have no idea what the next visual repertoire is going to be and the next arena of contest is going to be. It doesn't mean to say they're going to be making buildings made of glass and chrome for the next 80 years. It could be something completely different. So it's something for you now, as a young person, to start thinking about and start thinking about, right, what kind of buildings are being built in my area? What are they being made of? Why are they being made of that? Who's building them? Why are they building them? Um, they're all questions that you start asking now, and, and, and maybe those answers will be revealed. But I don't think it will stay the same forever. All I would say, though, is if you're interested in this or anything else about the city of Rome, um, please come up to the Classics Department and have a chat. We're going there in February on a Classics trip, um, so we'll be actually getting a chance to have these kind of conversations in front of the buildings, which is invaluable. Um, so maybe for the younger years, that's something to look forward to. So keep on with your life. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you.